thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. Um, this is the Next Society's webinar series on human milk and the prevention of necrotizing colitis. And we are thrilled to welcome about 275 or so participants from 18 different countries around the world. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We're really excited to have you. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and the recording will be available on the Next Society's website in the coming uh, weeks. So you can be sure to check that out when it's ready. Um, to reduce background noise, we've muted all of our participants, but we really wanna hear from you. So um, we encourage you to please share your questions. There's a Q&A box. So please make sure you're asking your questions there. We'll be checking it throughout the webinar. And then there's also a chat box. If you have comments or if you wanna engage in that discussion, you can um, use the chat box for um, that function. And we're so honored to dedicate this webinar series to McKenna Medbane. Um, that precious little one on your screen right there, that's baby McKenna. Um, and McKenna was born at 35 weeks, gestation nearly, weighing nearly um, four pounds. And she was diagnosed in utero with a genetic condition as well as a heart defect. And she developed necrotizing colitis, uh, which was eight days old and then passed away at about seven and a half weeks old. And she loved her mama's cuddles and getting her feet tickled by daddy. Um, and her family wants everyone to know about the risk factors that are associated with necrotized enterocolitis, as well as the protective factors that help to reduce a baby's chance of developing this disease. So um, as we're going throughout this, this webinar and this webinar series um, over the next few months, please join us in honoring McKenna and babies just like her as we work to build a world without this devastating disease. So um, thank you to McKenna and McKenna's family for um, allowing us to, to dedicate this webinar series to her and sharing her with um, all of us here. So this webinar series has been organized <clears throat> by Ravi Patel and I. Um, Ravi is a neonatologist at Emory University and has served on the Next Society's Scientific Advisory Council since uh, 2017. And for those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I'm Jennifer Kamser. I'm the founder and the director of the Next Society. Um, and I just wanted to share a photo of my son, Micah, there. Um, he died from complications of necrotized enterocolitis just before his first birthday um, in December of 2012. And then I founded the Next Society in 2014. And then I also wanted to share, since this is um, a webinar focused on mother's own milk, um, that since losing Micah, I've had the um, really honor of being able to donate my milk to the Kalamazoo Mother's Milk Bank in Michigan, the North Texas Mother's Milk Bank, as well as the Mother's Milk Bank in San Jose, California. Um, and I have a background in community organizing and um, just really thrilled to be here with all of you. So let's go ahead and give an overview of what today's webinar um, will be about. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you some, uh, an overview of what the Next Society is, some of our recent and upcoming projects. You'll hear from Ravi, who'll give our disclaimer and introduce Meg. And then Meg will explore some of the evidence-based strategies to support NICU moms in making milk for their babies, um, as well as health equity and how we can better engage families. And then we're planning to leave about 15 minutes or so uh, for discussion and Q&A. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so just to give you an introduction of the Next Society, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that brings together diverse stakeholders to build a world without necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, and we have become a truly international team of patient families, clinicians, and researchers that are just dedicated to improving outcomes for our most vulnerable infants at risk. And so all these photos were actually taken um, in June at the Next Symposium at the University of Michigan. So just a bit about what we do. Uh, the Next Society is focused on raising awareness, driving research, uniting diverse stakeholders, and helping to improve care for our babies that are at risk of neck. Um, we're working to create really a sense of urgency because um, babies like Micah and McKenna are dying from this disease every day. And so we really wanna do all that we can um, to prioritize resources and um, funding so that we could drive research and move this work forward. Um, and as many of you know, this webinar series on human milk is really building off of our spring webinar series that we hosted um, just you know, several months ago that was focused on probiotics. And that spring presentation um, that we're focused on probiotics, they're now available on our website along with all the probiotics slides and resources. Um, but for this webinar series, we hope you'll save the uh, upcoming dates. We have um, our next webinar on November 18th. We'll focus on donor milk with Aaron Hamilton Spence. 
and then on December 16th um, with uh, Deborah O'Connor focused on fortifiers. So please make sure you're able to join us for that. It should be great. We also wanted to mention that the Next Society has a blog where we regularly publish um, pieces from our clinicians, researchers, patients, families on all kinds of different issues. And we've had several blogs that focus on the importance of human milk and mother's own milk in the NICU. So um, you can consider checking out our blog and subscribing to that. We also want to make sure everyone's aware that um, in 2018, the Next Society came together with other leading neck charities in the world to establish uh, World Neck Awareness Day. So that's May 17th. So we just hope that you'll mark that on your calendar each year and join us in recognizing um, this day where we all focus on uh, raising awareness and preventing necrotizing enterocolitis. So this past June, as I mentioned, um, the Next Society hosted the Next Symposium at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, we were able to engage hundreds of participants from around the world, and we're really excited to share that our next meeting will take place in April of 2021 um, in partnership with JKIM and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So we are very close to announcing the venue and the specific dates for that meeting, um, but we hope you'll be able to join us for that, so stay tuned for more details. And then I wanted to give a quick shameless plug since the holidays are coming up. We hope you'll consider checking out the Next Society's online shop. We have Next Survivor shirts and onesies for um, you know, babies and young adults who have survived this disease. We also have items for families who have lost their babies um, and lots of other great things. So consider checking it out and supporting the Next Society. Also want to encourage everyone to <clears throat> Help us expand our reach. Social media has really allowed us to connect and grow a global community that's dedicated to helping us build um, a world without necrotizing colitis. So we hope you'll join us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we're also on YouTube, and just help us to continue expanding our reach. And finally, before I hand it over to Ravi, um, I wanted to mention that the Next Society recently received a $250,000 dollar engagement award, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And this will really allow us to drive research that's important to our families that have been affected by necrotizing colitis. And so um, as we go forward, um, we're looking to explore research questions. And so we'd love to hear from you like in the chat box or in the discussion, um, what questions do you have about human milk and neck, um, either for you know, Meg and Ravi, perhaps that could answer on this webinar, or just for the next society in general and things that we could consider um, addressing um, over this, this two-year project that we've just launched with Bacori through this engagement award. So um, again, just encourage you to share your thoughts, comments, suggestions, questions, um, either in that Q&A box or um, Q&A tool or that chat box. Um, but I think that's all I have. So I'm gonna hand it over to Ravi and um, thank you all so much. Hi everyone, uh, welcome. And we're really thrilled um, uh, to have this webinar series. And I did wanna start with a disclaimer um, that this is an educational webinar series and we're not um, providing medical advice, either any of the speakers um, or the, um, or, or the um, presenters. And I'm really thrilled to um, introduce our featured speaker for today, which is Dr. Meg Parker. Um, she's an associate professor of pediatrics and a health services uh, researcher and quality improvement expert. And she really has a very strong interest in human milk and breastfeeding in the NICU, and also in um, efforts to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in breastfeeding. Um, she also serves as the education chairperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics section on breastfeeding. And, um, and working on kind of collaborative work, she is the Associate Chair of the Neonatal Quality Improvement Collaborative of Massachusetts, and, and um, you'll get to hear Dr. Barker talk about some of the work they've been doing and some of the exciting um, tools they've created. And I think all, most importantly, uh, perhaps, is that she's also a milk donor, and she's donated uh, nearly uh, 2,500 ounces of her breast milk. And, um, and so we're really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Parker join us today, and we're looking forward to her talk. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jennifer and Ravi, for the wonderful introduction. I'm very honored to be part of this webinar series, um, and I'm just so impressed with the um, family-driven engagement and family-driven um, uh, just the whole Next Society from how its inception has been and the goals that it has. So I'm just, thank you guys so much for inviting me. Uh, today we'll be talking about um, the promotion of mother's own milk in the uh, first of three parts of this series. Um, 
trying to see if this is advancing. Okay. Um, so just a few disclosures. I'm a neonatologist. I work in, um, in inner city Boston at a safety net NICU. So that means that um, over 80% of the patients I care for have Medicaid insurance or considered um, in poverty. And so therefore a lot of what I will say and examples that I'll give are with that lens. Um, I serve on a research board of a local Himbana milk bank, and this is a volunteer position. Um, and as Robbie said, I'm the education chairperson for the AAP section on breastfeeding. And we are writing a clinical report on promoting human milk and breastfeeding for the VLBW infants. We're fairly far along on the report, and so a lot of the elements that I'll bring up will be things that will be in that report. And I do have funding that I receive from the Kellogg Foundation and from the NICHD. So as an outline, first I'll briefly talk about mother's own milk and it's associated with neck reduction. And then I've chosen um, six evidence-based hospital practices that we can do to support mothers in making milk during the NICU time period to really emphasize for all teams. Then I'll speak a bit about health equity and racial and ethnic disparities in mother's milk and solutions. And finally, uh, hone in on team, approach and team approaches for success in your own NICU. So first, what do we know about mother's milk? Um, so particularly for very low birth weight infants, we know that um, mother's own milk is associated with an array of health benefits, but one very important one is, of course, reduction of necrotizing enterocolitis and other bloodstream infections. Um, we know it's has associated with improved feeding tolerance and neurodevelopment and many maternal health benefits. But one thing I just wanna emphasize that you can see on that um, figure there on the left is that when you look at uh, the quantity that mother's milk is in these babies has a dose dependent relationship with reductions in neck. So therefore the more milk that a baby consumes is associated with uh, incremental decreases in neck, per, in neck. So now moving on to the bulk of the talk, which is about how can we support mothers in making milk? Um, one of the first questions to think about is, what do mothers actually want? What do they want to do? Um, so we know from studies that mothers of very preterm infants are actually more likely to initiate making milk or initiate lactation compared to mothers of term infants in the U.S. This is probably because they perceive their infants as being more vulnerable and because we tell them a lot more things about the importance of the health benefits for milk. However, we also know that mothers of very preterm infants often do not reach their own individual lactation goals. And that's something that we need to do to try to help them. So why does this happen? Um, well, there's many key barriers that these mothers face. First, we know that these women often have pre-existing and pregnancy related more medical morbidities such as preeclampsia or diabetes. And these things are associated with um, delayed uh, initiation of lactogenesis two or the milk letdown phase. Um, they also often are associated with decreased uh, milk production over time. Mothers of very low birth weight infants, they have prolonged mother-infant separation in the NICU, particularly U.S. NICUs with our maternity leave practices where mothers go back to work even while their babies are in the NICU. Um, this makes it very difficult for mothers to come and be with their babies and make milk and do skin-to-skin -skin care. Another kind of obvious thing for this group is that, of course, these mothers are pump dependent to get their milk out. Their babies can't suck on the breast, particularly in the beginning stages when they're very preterm. And we all know that um, sucking directly at the breast is a much more emotionally um, positive connection with babies um, compared to just getting your milk out with a pump. Finally, these mothers face many competing demands that are going to impede frequent milk expression. Um, such as, like I said, return to work, taking care of other children, transportation issues, a whole array of things that can make it hard for her to come to the NICU and to frequently pump her milk. So now moving on to some top six evidence-based hospital approaches to support mothers of preterm infants in making milk. So number one, the pump matters. Um, so not all breast pumps are created equal. Um, there's uh, but we know mothers, particularly of very preterm babies that are gonna be having only pumps as their sole way of getting their milk out. They need very effective and efficient double electric breast pumps, and they need these both in the hospital and at home. So at least in the US, there's hundreds of pumps out on the market. Um, if you go to Google 
different breast pumps, you're going to get a huge litany of types out there. Amazon, you'll see a ton. And these pumps are, they vary by their insurance reimbursement. So some insurances are going to uh, reimburse for some, which might be different than others. These pumps are going to vary in their suction power, um, the size that they are, whether they're small types of pumps you can stick in a backpack, um, or if it's like a big thing you have to carry with you. They vary in the size of the noise they make when they're actually working. Um, they vary by whether they're hands-free or not. So there's a whole bunch of different features that mothers take into account when they're trying to get their pumps. Um, and these pump qualities are also going to impact how well the mother's milk is going to be able to be extracted over time. So examples of quote-unquote hospital-grade pumps that are used in U.S. hospitals are the Medela Symphony pump and the Amita Elite. I think in the U.S. these are the most commonly ones used in the hospital time period. Um, but these are exceedingly expensive. They're really meant for multiple person use, which is why they're usually in hospitals. Um, and very few women could afford to buy that um, at home. Many women choose to rent them instead. But even a lot of our women can't even afford the rentals. So hospitals have a variety of different ways that they can provide these pumps for women at home. Um, one other thing I want to emphasize that even if the mother has a pump or has a really good pump, she's not going to succeed unless she really knows what to do with it. Um, so mothers really must be trained in how to use their pump prior to discharge home if at all possible. I've learned recently that there's areas of the country where it's very common for mothers to go obtain their pumps for home after they themselves are discharged. And this is really a problem because those hours or even the first day after a mother goes home, if she's not pumping, that's really a critical time in which she's going to maintain her milk production. So ideally, she wants to be able to get her pump prior to her own discharge and have training in how to use it. Mothers also need to have all the equipment they need. So there are the phalanges. Um, they need to have the correct size. Different mothers have different sizes that they need. They need all the tubing, all the parts, and they need to know how they all work. Um, they also need to have storage containers with labels. There's been numerous times when I've had a mom run out of storage containers and that um, she ended up throwing, she literally told me she threw some of her milk away because she didn't know what to do with it. So we can't let that happen. NICU staff need to be trained in navigating some of the basics, okay? So how to use the pump, how to set up the suction, the suction strength, how to deal with a mom who reports pain with her pumping, and how to make sure they can help mom get the proper phalange fit. So moving on to, um, Number two, which I'm calling milk expression, the timing. So current expert opinion is to initiate first milk expression within six hours after birth. Um, so this has been quoted in the WHO 10 steps for guidelines for separated mother infant dyads. Um, and it's also in uh, this newer document that we have, um, expansion of the baby friendly hospital initiative 10 steps um, NICU expert recommendations. However, please keep in mind that the data supporting this recommendation so far has been mainly based on reports from single centers um, or from pilot RCTs with relatively small numbers. So this is just a data slide from a study that my team recently did. Um, so it's a, we did a data-driven approach to determining the optimal timing of first milk expression among about 1,100 mother VLBW infant dyads. Um, and we took mothers from our human milk uh, quality improvement collaborative among nine centers, and we used a data-driven approach, it's actually called recursive partitioning, to basically have the computer um, determine what is a cut point that was associated with the longest time of lactation um, in this cohort of women in Massachusetts. And for this particular study, we actually came up with a cut point of eight hours so meaning that if mothers um, pumped before eight hours, they had a longer or higher rate of having a lactation at the point of discharge or transfer compared to mothers who pumped after eight hours. And this was true for both our any mother's milk at the point of discharge as well as exclusive mother's milk at the point of discharge. So that was um, great to see a large observational study to better understand that. Um, but keep in mind, the gold standard here would be to really do a large randomized control trial to determine the optimal timing of first milk expression. Um, so I will say that this study has been done and we're anxiously awaiting its publication. 
It has been conducted by Leslie Parker and colleagues uh, down in Florida, and she is actively pursuing getting it published. So I'm very excited to see what she's going to show, because that's definitely going to help answer this really important question. Another point I'll make here that often is presented to me is that it's unclear if first milk expression or what, what to do about this issue of should first milk expression happen from a pump or hand expression, which one is superior. So I think based on our existing studies, it's, it's hard to know for sure. Um, there has been some studies on, that showing things in both directions. Um, so first, also consider there's pros and cons to each. So first with the pump, I would say that pumps have to be accessible uh, and easily obtainable in labor and delivery in the postpartum area if you're gonna do your first um, milk expression with a pump. Um, pumps can take longer to set up and use compared to hand expression. Um, sometimes staff I hear have more comfort in helping mother with a pump rather than helping her with hand expression. Um, and the pump also requires some staff training. In the converse, hand expression, there's very minimal equipment needed. It's very quick and easy to do. It can take five to 10 minutes. Um, some staff I hear feel less comfortable helping mothers with hand expression, but still I would see, I've seen many, many teams overcome this and have labor and delivery nurses or doulas or other people that are easily able to help mom get her, her first uh, milk expression um, by hand. Um, again, this also is gonna require some staff training. Also, I wanna bring up there are some important barriers to consider to achieve this goal of early milk expression. This is something I've interacted with a lot of teams, uh, both in Massachusetts and now in other states about how they try to do this in their hospital. So first I'd say there's a lot of very important competing demands regarding maternal care in the immediate postpartum period. So labor and delivery nurses and doctors and other staff, they're right in the first hours after birth often administering very important medications. They're doing important assessments of the mothers for bleeding and pain and all sorts of things of that nature. There's also handoffs that occur. So women in the US anyways, are most often transferred over to the postpartum area by two hours after birth if it's a vaginal delivery or four hours after birth if it's a C-section. So you have this whole changeover in staff. So coming up with a time to adequately support a mother in their first milk expression is just another thing to keep in mind that these um, staff are needing to do. Sometimes I hear resistance from staff saying, I don't think I can do this. There's so many other things I need to do. Um, or I hear things like the mother's really sick at that time period. She really just needs to rest. But what I will say in response to that is that when you talk to mothers themselves about their experience when they first make their milk and first make colostrum for their baby, they generally feel this is a way less invasive procedure than actually giving birth. And many mothers are totally fine in my experience with getting the help they need to first express their milk in the first hours after birth. So some tips I have for doing this at your hospital. First is that the supplies have to be readily available. So wherever you're gonna go to get that first milk expression, you have to have the milk, the expression kits and the pumps, if you're gonna do pumps, they have to be right there and easily available for your staff. The NICU team must, must, must collaborate with the OB nursing staff on postpartum and on labor and delivery to get this job done. This really has to be probably primarily driven by the mother's provider, not the baby's provider. And so at this time period, the first hours after birth, you really need to collaborate very strongly with that OB nursing team. I would say that the success I've seen from others is to incorporate this first milk expression into the existing staff workflow. So a good example of this is, I've seen a team do this where they really tried to incorporate the first milk expression into the postpartum admission bundle. So at the same time, the mother is getting her vital signs checked, her fund is checked, that kind of thing the mother also gets her first milk expression that occurs all at that time period. Trouble I see is that a team tries to um, do all of the vital signs, et cetera, and then they come back an hour later to do the first milk expression. And of course the mom has fallen asleep by that point. So just incorporating that into the entire first admission bundle can be a successful um, way to go. Another thing I've seen is just to really get the family involved. I worked with one team that had their pump in the PACU and they would make the family support person, their primary job was to literally hold the phalanges on the mom while she pumped. 
um, and they just sort of really got the family involved. So whatever you can do, usually the family members are really looking to try to help and they can actually help mother with their first milk expression. Okay, moving on to number three, which is frequency of milk expression. So again, the current opinion is to, the current expert opinion is to pump um, about eight times in 24 hours or every two to three hours. Um, I would say that the existing data does suggest that many mothers don't comply with this recommendation. Um, in fact, when you look at studies that are examining the frequency of pumping to prolonged lactation, most of the cut points that they pick are on the order of four to seven times a day. Um, so even in these studies, it, there hasn't been enough mothers that have really achieved this pumping um, eight or more times for them to study it well. So that's what the current studies have shown. That being said, the more frequent pumping has is associated with greater milk production. One other thing I wanna bring up is that there have been studies looking at the location where mothers pump. And this one study that I'll highlight showed that pumping next to the baby's bedside or particularly after doing skin to skin care yielded a greater breast milk production. So in reality, different mothers make different amounts of milk when they pump. We all know there's some um, variation between different mothers and how much milk they make. So ideally, we would tell mothers to pump enough to reach certain milk volumes, but mothers usually don't keep track of this. Some do, some keep pumping logs and keep track of volumes, but on the whole, many mothers don't keep track of this. Um, so it's, so therefore, we generally go by just suggesting certain amount of time or frequent pumping is better. I did wanna highlight some recent studies coming out of the Rush Milk Club in Chicago. Um, where they have shown that production of milk at 500 ml a day by day 14 is associated with longer lactation in mothers of VLBW infants. And again, this to me just stresses the importance of frequent lactation or frequent um, pumping, particularly in the very first week or so, or even two weeks after birth, because that's a time when you're really establishing your milk supply. So as a take home, mothers should pump as often as they can, particularly in the first two weeks when the milk supply is being established. So some tips I have also for, um, based on the interactions I've had with various hospital teams. Um, first, peer support has been shown to be very effective. Um, that mothers, when they're trying to keep up their pumping, it's often because of motivation um, and just being super tired and frustrated and having so many competing demands. And peer support um, from other mothers that have gone through the experience can be very powerful in that scenario. Um, other things I've seen people do is trying to come up with ways to help make it easier for mothers to come to the hospital um, to you to pump there or do skin to skin. So transportation and parking, cutting down those barriers, um, helping mothers with pumping logs. So a lot of hospitals choose that. Um, another thing I've seen people do is have scheduled check-ins by lactation. So in lieu of just reaching out to the mom when she happens to show up for the NICU, about how her lactation is going by the lactation consultants, um, scheduling check-ins where they call the mother or ask how she's doing at home um, can also be very effective to maintain connection with moms and help her with her motivation for ongoing pumping. Number four, skin-to-skin uh, -skin care. So skin-to-skin -skin care should be encouraged as much as possible and for as long as the family desires. Um, I think there's many benefits to skin-to-skin -to -skin care. Uh, physiologic benefits to the baby, um, bonding benefits with the family, but one of those is also improved milk production, and this has been seen in a number of different studies. I do want to highlight that there is an American Academy of Pediatrics report from Bailey et al. from the Committee of Fetus and Newborn specifically on um, skin to skin care for both term and preterm infants, and it's referenced there if you guys want to take a look. I think the controversy tends to ally in our NICUs regarding which infants are actually eligible, quote unquote, eligible for skin to skin care. And having seen this now in a few different states, there's tremendous hospital variation about which places think babies are eligible for different criteria. Um, that being said, the skin to skin can safely occur with babies on ventilators, um, babies on CPAP, and definitely with babies with securely placed central lines. Um, and hospitals vary a lot on these things, but there are many hospitals that do skin to skin during all of those types of scenarios, and um, they say it goes quite well for them. 
I will say that if you are going to put a baby in skin to skin who is on a ventilator in particular, you definitely are going to need to involve your respiratory therapy staff and other nursing staff to make sure the baby gets um, safely into that position without dislodging their endotracheal tube, for example. So tips on trying to improve skin to skin care in your NICU. Um, first, you definitely need to think about your equipment. So these mothers and fathers that are doing skin to skin care, um, they need proper reclining and supportive chairs to do this. Um, I would say having policy or guideline on skin to skin care that's very inclusive um, and takes into account the different um, medical um, scenarios, the different scenarios of the different types of babies that could do skin to skin care to help staff um, are great. Another thing I've seen people do is uh, these kangarooathons where they kind of do this big education blitz on skin to skin care, try to make it really fun. Um, and track skin to skin very closely for a short period of time and really promote it in their NICU. Another thing that can be really helpful is to use family voices um, when you're talking to staff. So for example, I think those of us who've been there themselves pumping or have talked really to any mother, everybody knows that the emotional connection that you have with the baby doing skin to skin is so powerful and so much more powerful than actually using a breast pump. So um, talking to families about the importance, or talking to your NICU staff about the importance of that um, can often help convince people in your NICU um, or can help you with uh, increasing buy-in for doing skin to skin. This team in particular had these uh, crib cards. So they put these little cards next to the beds when they were eligible for skin to skin. Um, and that would help remind both parents and staff um, that the babies should be performing it and doing it as much as possible. Number five, direct breastfeeding. Um, so we know longer duration of lactation is associated with initial oral feedings at the breast, more frequent direct breastfeeding, and earlier gestational age at the time of first breastfeeding attempt. Okay, um, there have been, uh, we do recommend that we should be initiating oral feedings um, according to feeding cues. So not necessarily based on gestational age weeks. However, because that's often still helpful for people to anchor in when this can actually occur, there's definitely studies showing that babies can start um, nursing at the breast at 31 to 33 weeks, okay? Um, I personally like to warn people about risks of aspiration that can occur with oral feedings when you're on CPAP or high flow or certainly ventilated. So at least at our institution, we only uh, do direct breastfeeding um, or even feedings with the bottle with breast milk when the babies are off of high flow and off of CPAP. So why is direct breastfeeding so hard for us uh, in the NICU environment? Um, first in the NICU, we're very, very focused on measuring the volumes that the babies consume. And it makes us nervous when, we don't, when we're unable to do that when a baby's um, directly breastfeeding. Um, we also really want to make sure that a baby receives fortified breast milk, and that is very important. Um, and so there's sometimes this tension as a, ma as a baby is beginning to feed more um, to make sure that some of the feeds are given through the bottle with fortified milk. We also know that preterm infants' feeding ability evolves quickly. In the beginning, they might just be taking small amounts of milk, but over time, they can really change. And so sometimes it's hard for us to um, keep track of how quickly the baby's feeding ability is happening um, when we're uh, assessing feeding at the breast compared to the bottle. And lastly, a reason direct breastfeeding can be hard is because mothers can't come to the NICU as often as they want or even we want um, to keep up and really establish direct breastfeeding. So tips I have on improving this in your NICU. Um, one suggestion I have is just to come up with a guideline that the first five to seven days of any feedings, oral feedings a baby receives should only be at the breast to try to make sure that those initial feedings are, are there with the mother and help establish direct breastfeeding over time. You can come up with guidelines for non-nutritive sucking. I've seen teams do that to help um, overall. Um, you can introduce the idea that early direct breastfeeding is an important thing that mothers should be doing. I also suggest when you first talk to mothers about it, just explaining in the beginning, it's usually not nutritive. Um, there's not a lot of milk that's actually gonna be sucked out. The idea here is just to have the baby get used to the breast. So that type of messaging. 
And last, I just want to emphasize post-discharge feeding plans. So these really need to incorporate the maternal lactation goals. So when you're coming up with your feeding plans for ongoing, for post-discharge, um, you want to consider both the maternal lactation goals and the possible fortification needs. Um, so if a mom really does not want to do direct breastfeeding and she only wants to continue to exclusively pump, then of course your plan should keep that in mind. If you have a mother that really does want to do all direct breastfeeding or at least some over time, you want to make sure that you come up with a plan that supports that. I've seen teams do things like um, have about half of the feeds at the breast and half of the feeds with a bottle with fortification with an idea that that would change over time. Um, but again, you just need to have this very well um, written out in your post-discharge plan and very clear with the post-discharge provider and with the mother. Finally, concrete plans for post-discharge lactation support are important. Number six, so education, both for staff and for families. So first for the staff. So staff lactation education um, is needed in the following areas. So we need to teach staff about mother's milk benefits, strategies to maximize lactation and proper milk storage, and technical expertise in using pumps, hand expression, and assessing latch. So one thing that's really important to me to get across is that this is important for all staff. So it can't only be the lactation consultants that know these things. It also can't only be the nurses and the lactation consultants. And it also can't only be female staff. So all staff members need to be on the same page, um, need to be trained in the same ways about how to support mothers. Um, and we also know from studies that staff education changes both their knowledge and their attitudes towards breastfeeding support for these women. Now, education for families. Optimally, I think this should include the health benefits and also some just real practical information for the mother on how she's going to get this milk out and what kind of journey she's going to have while she has a very preterm infant in the NICU. So the mother needs to know about the early and frequent milk expression, the role of non-nutritive sucking and oral feedings at the breast. Um, she needs to have uh, support on technical expertise in the pumps, milk storage, and transport. Ideally, this should begin prenatally. Um, one thing I've seen a lot of times is that when I see a mother soon after birth, she definitely has heard about the health benefits of milk, and she definitely wants to provide milk for her baby. But less often does she actually know what it's needed to do that for a, a mother of a very low birth weight infant. So we have to focus not just on the benefits, but just sort of these really concrete steps to try to get the milk out as much as possible, okay? Um, some studies, randomized control studies, have actually showed that education can increase both the intent to breastfeed and reduce maternal anxiety when she understands better what it's going to be needed, what's going to be needed. Um, and I also think it's really important for us to remember that we want to provide this education um, in conjunction with an assessment of the maternal lactation goals. So moms often have their own goals about what they want to do, and so we, we need to keep those in mind when we're providing our education. Um, also, I wanted to show you guys a few concrete examples of education materials that you are free to use that we've developed with our team here in Massachusetts. Um, so we developed these four different uh, education handouts that you can deliver to families, and we've translated them into eight different languages. So a problem we found in our NICU was that a lot of people had stuff in English and Spanish and maybe one other language, but they often didn't have things in the array of other languages that they sometimes interact with families with. So feel free to download these at any time. They're on our website, um, and we really hope that people can benefit from them. Sometimes people ask me if, I, if they can have permission to distribute them freely in their NICU, and they absolutely can. And the next thing we want to show you are these family education videos that we've made that, again, we hope people can use. Um, so we developed these. There's five topics. We developed these videos for families to help them in lactation support in the NICU with the vision that they would be given only in the parent voice, the providers were not involved, that it's parents speaking to parents about both the difficulties and the successes um, with trying to make breast milk for a baby. These are in both English and Spanish, and they're meant to be both educational and motivational for families. They're also supposed to be viewed on their smartphone. So, you guys can right now at home, wherever you're watching this, if you take your iPhone um, or any other phone up to the computer screen right now, 
you should be able to click on that QR code and it should prompt right on your phone. Um, and so we're gonna show you an example of one of these videos. And so I will um, segue over to Robbie, who's gonna show you where this link should take you. So this is uh, so, the website that um, do you wanna, that um, you should all see, um, neoqic in Massachusetts, ma.org. If you go down to family educational materials, um, this tab and then human milk videos, That neat. So I'm going to just play one of these videos so you can see how it, how it uh, looks. And Meg, do you have anything you'd like to add before I close? Um, just to know that they're, they're all right here. This is what you guys would get the link for. There's five in English. And then if you scroll down, Robbie, you can see the five that are in Spanish. When you're in the NICU, every day is a new adventure. Ah. Yesterday is over. I never dwell on what was. I never worry about what's to come. I live more in the present than I ever have because that's what you have to do. I knew I wanted to breastfeed. I delivered my daughter at 819 at night and I was on my breast pump for the first time at 20 minutes of 10. This experience has been a roller coaster. It's my first baby in the NICU and it's been very emotional. I chose to make breast milk for my baby because one thing I learned is, is it builds a very strong bond between the mother and the baby. Having to pump every two hours is exhausting, you know, to wake up to a machine in the middle of the night. But the reason why I chose to breastfeed was to help Fiona grow, um, help her brain development, and definitely build her immunities. Breast milk is the healthiest thing for a child. There's a lot more nutrients and protein and everything that he needed and any child needs to develop themselves. And given that he was born so early, it wasn't an option. I know in breast milk there are tons of antibodies. Um, I knew him being premature, um, not knowing how long he was going to be in the NICU, um, that those antibodies will prevent infection. Because he's so early, I wanted to make sure that he was extra protected. My mother didn't like the idea of me being a breastfeeding mom. It wasn't until she saw her granddaughter and how tiny she was that she became my biggest advocate. Just being able to provide milk for her was the biggest thing I could do for her, other than holding her. And one of the best things is coming in to see your baby or even just those photos of your baby and having a wall of photos and looking at the progress of your baby is something that would make you smile. This experience has taught me to have more patience, have more faith, and even when you feel as though the times are getting rough, it's just getting better. I think being in the NICU has made me a good mom, I think. Um, I've changed so much and just being more nurturing, I have so much more patience. You know, it's hard watching him, all the tools hooked up to him and him breathing and how he have to eat and we have to come in and talk to him and give him strength and make him grow, which made him how he looks now. I can't even say he's a baby. That's my little big man right there. <laughs> disparities in mother's milk among very low birth weight infants. Uh, so just like term infants, 
we have seen a general increase in the amount of breast milk that babies have received um, due to a whole array of different public health measures, um, evidence that's been published. So we're very happy to see that. So you can see this overall trend. However, there's still very important disparities to keep in mind. So in particular, um, if you look at the red and the blue line here, those are our um, non-Hispanic white and Hispanic population in the US. Um, but then down below, there's this huge gap between where the Native American and the non-Hispanic Blacks have, um, have been um, trending in the past decade. So how do we address this problem? Just wanted to give you guys a few tidbits. Um, the first is at the local NICU level. One important thing you guys can do is first just collect and examine your data. Try to understand, do you have the same disparities in your NICU um, and uh, as elsewhere? And, uh, and when are the disparities emerging? Is it early on in the hospitalization? Is it later on in the hospitalization? And then try to have interventions that can help um, address those things. And this is just an example of one thing we found in Massachusetts. We did the same thing is we wondered when did the disparities emerge? And so you can see in Massachusetts, our, the white is in the blue, the black is in the red, and the Hispanics were in the yellow. And you can see for the first three weeks of hospitalization, we actually don't see a lot of differences um, in the different racial ethnic groups. But starting from uh, day 28 and onward, you start to see this big emergence of these racial ethnic disparities, um, where at least in our state, our Hispanics were, had the lowest rate of mother's milk at the point of discharge, then our blacks and then our whites. So therefore, we actually started doing a variety of different initiatives to think what's happening in the second half of the hospitalization. Um, and in particular, what's happening with our Hispanic population. So this might not be the exact same for you uh, in your state or in your actual hospital, but you're not gonna know unless you look and try to see where these disparities might be. So some, some potential strategies. Um, first things, uh, sometimes just thinking about NICU level family engagement practices that could support women. Um, so again, I emphasize a lot of women sometimes have trouble um, getting to their NICU because it's really far away um, uh, be, or because of transportation barriers, at least in the inner city, parking costs are enormous and can be a big problem. Um, hospitals just offering hot meals for breastfeeding mothers can be helpful. Having less restrictive sibling visitation so that mothers with a lot of other children can actually come to see their babies or trying to come up with ways to make that as safe as possible. Um, when you think about infection reasons as well. Um, having family support groups to again provide that motivation for mothers. Then there's some individual level interventions I'll, run, I'll mention. So again, peer counselors have been shown to be very effective, um, particularly in the non-Hispanic black population um, to help again with the motivational aspect. Um, also having pump rental programs for mothers that either can't afford the pump rental or just loaner pump programs for mothers that can get the Medela symphonies at home. Um, uh, so I mentioned before the local NICU level, so just collect and examining your data to understand that part. I also just wanted to mention state, regional, and national level things. So again, policies that support maternal lactation are very important. Um, so this was just a, something that just got pulled, um, it should say September 2019 here. So the Vermont Oxford Network um, pulled the rates of very low, the rates of mother's milk at the point of discharge among states that have lactation support policies versus states that don't. And you can see that the policies definitely um, make a difference here. So in states that have breastfeeding, um, supports for breastfeeding in the workplace, paid or unpaid paid maternity leave, anti-discrimination clauses about breastfeeding, you can see that there's substantially higher breastfeeding rates among the states that have those policies. So just again, a plug for us to also keep in mind that we need to support these as a neonatal community policy efforts for lactation. Last, team-based approaches. Um, so these are successful at improving lactation during the hospital time period for mothers of preterm infants. And I just wanted to provide a few elements of effective teams. So again, multidisciplinary, this can't just be your lactation consultants. They need to involve a variety of different people. Um, there needs to be consistent communication to families across team members. So the things that the doctor's saying have to be the same things, the lactation consultants, et cetera. Um, you need to integrate lactation support practices into the daily workflow. I've said that earlier, I think. 
ongoing data-driven feedback so that teams see how they're doing is really motivational. And last, just one thing to emphasize, because I've seen this in many studies now, is the importance of physician buy-in. That again, this initiative can't just be led by um, lactation consultants and nurses, but physicians also need to buy into the importance of this and talk to mothers often um, and fathers often about what's happening. Last, um, it's helpful to use local and statewide quality improvement structures. So you wanna track data over time, consider using key driver diagrams, do PDSA cycles, and sharing your work. So if you work with someone that does a perinatal quality improvement collaborative structure in your state or region, definitely reaching out because um, human milk has been a very common one that people have worked together on. Um, we have a lot of materials that people can use on our website, examples of key driver diagrams, PDSA cycles, examples of interventions that I'm happy to share with you. Um, I also wanted to point out some articles of states that have done this. Um, so Henry Lee published from California in 2012, and we did this in Massachusetts, and our paper just came out this year in 2019. And I also just wanted to mention this other paper I did with Aloka Patel from Rush, um, where we summarized all the state metrics from, I wanna say it's seven to 10 states across the country that have all conducted statewide QI projects in human milk, and we compare and contrast all of the different metrics they used. Um, so people can feel free to take a look at that too. So what did I leave out? Of course, I had to leave out a lot here. Um, first, for oral colostrum care, there's a lot of data emerging regarding its benefits. I think there's very little risks to doing oral colostrum care, so I'm certainly supportive of this practice. Um, babies that receive mother's milk need fortification for their nutritional needs. Um, I'm gonna defer to Dr. O'Connor's talk in December, who will talk about all the intricate details of this. Um, we know for sure we need it in hospital time period. The post-discharge fortification story is a little less clear right now. Um, informal milk sharing, generally in the US, this is discouraged because of possible safety risks. Um, and we recommend Himbana milk banks or Prolact or some other um, source where pasteurization occurs. Um, if you wanna know about the contraindications to mother's milk, I suggest going to one of our AAP statements or LactMed, which is available online. CMV, again, there could be a whole talk on CMV, but I knew it's a very hot topic, so just wanted to have a few bullet points here. Um, one of the main very important thing is if you have a baby that's presenting with symptoms of late onset sepsis, please consider breast milk acquired CMV for that. Okay, so please look for it um, when you're doing your workup. There's a big controversy, there's somewhat of a controversy about freezing. Um, so we know that freezing milk reduces, but it does not completely eliminate uh, the viral load of CMV in mother's milk. Um, however, we know that freezing also reduces some of the um, positive bioactive properties of mother's milk. Um, recently, there was a meta-analysis that was published uh, showing that the freezing of the milk um, didn't change the risk of CMV sepsis-like syndrome, so when the babies are very ill. Um, so therefore, I'd say most NICUs, at least in the U.S., are not routinely freezing or pasteurizing mother's own milk. I know this is different in different areas of the world. Lastly, in terms of the, what's happening, what's the long-term picture here? Um, so the large cohort studies examining long-term risks of postnatal breast milk acquired CMV are emerging. And just to point one study here, there was a cohort of about 350 babies less than 32 weeks that were followed out to age six in the Netherlands and they found no difference in the neurodevelopmental outcomes among the 14% with postnatally acquired CMV versus the 86% without. I do suspect in the next five to 10 years, we'll have more data looking at long-term outcomes, which will be really helpful and important. Galactagogues. Um, so domperidone has been associated with increased milk production among mothers of preterm infants and RCTs. That being said, in the US in 2004, the FDA issued a warning against it um, for breastfeeding mothers because there were some case reports of cardiac arrest and arrhythmias among mothers that were taking this medication in an IV form. Um, so with that sort of quote unquote black box warning, I think some hospitals still do use oral domperidone and some are not. Overall, I'd say there's a paucity of RCTs examining efficacy and safety of herbal galactagogues among mothers of very preterm infants. 
and I think that's it. I want to thank everybody. Um, just wanted to acknowledge our NeoQuick Human Milk Leadership Team and the Vermont Oxford Network for helping me with that one particular study and our funding source. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. That was awesome. That was great. We have one question um, that's uh, somebody who works at a children's hospital in Detroit and they aren't a birth hospital. And the question was, uh, we don't have direct immediate access to mothers. So in this situation, what can we do to promote pumping? Um, so I have definitely had this come up. Um, so I'd say a couple things. In, focus on what your transport team does. Make sure your transport team, when they first interact with the mom and get the consent, can touch base about the importance of her breast milk. Make sure your transport team is transporting the milk with the baby as much as possible that often can get le left out. Um, and then the third is you can talk to your nurses that are taking care of the baby and when they touch base by phone, because I know for sure they're touching base by phone to talk to that mom, they can make sure in those conversations they ask her about how her pumping and breastfeeding is going. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here about, um, we have a large Medicaid population and our local um, DME, the Durable Medical Equipment, offers only single electric um, breast pumps. And uh, they said Medicaid won't cover better pump. So any suggestions or alternatives of how these mothers can secure better pumps? Um, this hospital doesn't, um, they do have hospital grade rentals, but many can't afford um, even that expense as you mentioned. Um, so I hear what you're saying. This is a huge problem. I think it's an equity problem. If mothers of a certain um, socioeconomic group are able to afford pumps and then others can't, like that's a problem I think we need to work on from a policy perspective. Um, so that's sort of the high level answer is working uh, with any people in your state that are doing like AAP related folks or AAP um, state group about that issue um, from a policy level. More locally, if there's any way you can get money for like a loaner program. I see some NICUs like mine, we have a loaner program where we have like 10 pumps and we loan them out for those mothers that literally can't pay the 60 or 70 bucks a month to rent. So that's what we do. But those would be my two suggestions, but it's a big problem. And uh, there's a follow-up about um, uh, the question about, um, as part of a transport team, how, how do you safely transport breast milk when you're kind of transporting babies or bringing babies on transport? Um, I would transport it the same way that we ask the mothers to transport it to the hospital. So it's usually just a little bag with an ice pack. Um, nothing really fancy, just like any old, you know, bags that have an ice pack in it is fine. Um, and this is a, um, a question from a, a mother's perspective um, regarding pumping versus hand expression. And when no milk is coming, um, the, the um, but you can plug a pump in and it'll do its job, whereas with hand expression, it's confusing and demotivating. And, um, and I kept asking myself, am I doing it right? So any thoughts when you're um, kind of from the perspective of when things aren't working and you're trying hand pumping? Um, mm. So if I understand the question of the intent of this, this mother um, about if, if she's doing the technique correctly in the hand expression, so you're correct, there's an actual technique that you need to do with the hand expression about the way you actually touch your breasts and push them um, to get the milk out. Um, so there's, there's definitely plenty of materials available that you can look up online um, that you can show families with, but for sure having a provider that's trained in how you do milk expression adequately should help you in the beginning so that you know what to do. Um, and to me, the answer to that is like, we need to help you better. <laughs> like we need to make sure you know exactly what's happening. Um, some mothers I know in the beginning, they like the hand expression in that very beginning in particular, because sometimes they say the colostrum drops come out more easily than a pump in the very beginning. We know that um, you have to pump over time, over the long haul, you have to use a pump to get out your milk, but hand expression in the very beginning, you can definitely get milk. Uh, we have a question about um, any update on, on feeding during blood transfusion. Um, we lost a baby boy who received a transfusion while feeding uh, mother's milk and fortifier and contracted neck. 
I'm going to defer that question to Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, He's the uh, expert. <laughs> I'll wait in a, a little bit. You know, I, I think there's still, a, you know, I would say there's still uncertainty about um, whether or not um, feeding during bread, blood transfusion influences the risk of, of NEC. There's lots of good beneficial things in breast milk. And um, I think when you stop feeding, you, you may, depending on how long you do it and for a period of time, you may actually, you know, remove those beneficial, your, your infants from receiving those. So I, I would say that there's still uncertainty about um, that. There's a large trial in the United Kingdom that is um, called the WHEAT trial that's going to look at this specific question. Um, they've just started um, kind of a pilot phase, but it's um, going to look at whether or not we should um, feed infants during transfusion if that influences the risk of neck. So um, just starting up, it will probably be several years, um, but stay tuned for, for that. And we're so sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing the question. Mm -hmm. I had a question in terms of, you know, these these nice kind of packet of, packet of evidence-based practices. If a hospital is just starting and trying, do you have thoughts on where you think the biggest um, kind of bang for your buck is in terms of where to focus on the different types of um, practices that may, um, that they can choose from if they're working on an improvement effort? So, you know, getting mothers to pump quickly versus increasing kangaroo care. Do you have thoughts on where they should kind of team should start or, um, or where, where the, the yeah that's a great question although I think from like a from a human behavior team-based approach perspective I would say they should start where where they think they're going to get the biggest win like in their NICU with a culture that exists and the interactions they currently have with all the other staff go with something they think is going to be likely to be successful so if they think that skin-to-skin -skin care, people are excited about it, they're ready for it, they really want to do it more, I would go with that and then move on to the harder things that involve collaboration with OB, for example. But if they're a NICU that is really um, worked very closely with their OB team and they have some champions there, maybe they should go with that. So I kind of will turn it around. And I almost think they're all very important. Um, I think sustaining milk products, the pump is sort of a critical one. You have to have the right pump. But in terms of an actual team's next step, I would point it towards where they think they're going to be the most successful or make the most improvement. Well, thank you. Thank you, Meg, so much for joining us today. And I hope everyone will take the time to join us in November for our webinar on donor milk with Aaron Hamilton Spence. So thank you, and we hope to see you in November. Thanks.